We're living in a time when speech has lost its value. People do not respect speech. When I say respecting speech, I'm talking about using speech in a clean way, avoiding vulgarisms, avoiding gossip and slander. Speech is the most important gift that God gave a human being. That's why our sages, when it refers to humanity as opposed to animals, refers to the human being not as sikhli, an intellectual being, but as midaber, a speaker, someone who could communicate profound ideas, ideas of wisdom, ideas of love, and this is what makes us fully human. And when we abuse that, we're abusing a very, very important aspect of who we are. And the Torah, in this week, the first parsha that we read, Matos, talks about vows. People would sometimes make vows. Let's say a person feels that they are tempted by certain kinds of behavior, certain types of food, and they make a vow, I'm not going to eat this food, I'm not going to eat apple pie anymore because it's not good for my health. And that gives them the strength to be able to keep their diet. That's an example of why a person would make a vow. And the Torah says that even though there's nothing that is forbidden to engage in, otherwise you're allowed to eat that apple pie, but once you made that vow, the apple pie becomes like pork to you, you and you alone. But then the Torah although it's not written explicitly in the Torah, it's based on the oral tradition, we are told that the rabbis have the power, and it's the only place where you find this power, to renounce, to invalidate the vow. You come to three rabbis and they question you about your vow, and if you show them that you really didn't mean the vow because if you knew the consequences of how it's going to affect your life, you would have never made the vow. The rabbis are empowered by the Torah to annul that vow. And I'm sure most people who are listening to this, who have ever been to a synagogue on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, are aware of the fact that Yom Kippur, we begin the solemn day with Kol Nidre, which is about renouncing vows. That if we had any vows, there are two versions, one that we renounce the vows of the past, one where we declare the vows that we may make in the future to be null and void. And everyone asks the question, and there are so many different uh, 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 explanations, why would we enter in the most solemn day of the year, such a holy day, with a legalistic formula of renouncing vows? As I said, there are many answers to this, but I want to share one answer from the Rogachev, or Yosef Rosen, who was one of the greatest Talmudic scholars of the 20th century. And he says something very interesting. He said, we find in the Talmud that whenever there is a ceremony, a ritual, that is not mentioned explicitly in the Torah, but was transmitted through the oral tradition, the rabbis made much to do about those rituals, they, a lot of fanfare. For example, the, uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in the oral Torah, so they didn't believe in the way we calculate the offering of the Omer and the counting of the days. And whenever they cut the grain for the Omer, that's the barley offering they brought on the second day of Passover, they would make a lot of fanfare. They would announce that what they were doing, they would repeat it three times. And likewise, other rituals that the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the oral Torah, would disagree with that ritual. They would make a major point of doing that ritual with fanfare to underscore the importance of the oral Torah, that Judaism, without the oral Torah, is not Judaism. You can't really understand the written Torah, the Bible, the, the Torah, the, what people call the, simply the Torah, without the oral interpretations that were given down to Moses at Mount Sinai. One of the areas in which the people who did not believe in the oral Torah certainly did not accept the idea of renouncing vows, because nowhere does it mention in the Torah. All it says in the Torah that when a person makes a vow, he has to keep whatever he said. But the oral tradition, and it's hinted, in a few places in the Torah, but it's, it's a hint that you would never figure on your own. It's only because it was transmitted orally. So therefore, the Rogachever says, that's why we announce our vows before Yom Kippur, as if to say, we do not accept a, a half a Torah. We embrace the Torah in its entirety. And one may add that Yom Kippur is an appropriate time for that because when did God give the Torah to the Jewish people? I'm sure most of you will answer the holiday of Shavuot. 
That's true. But he also gave the second tablets on the holiday of Yom Kippur. When Moses came down with the tablets, we all know, and he saw the Jews worshiping the golden calf, he shattered the tablets. He went back up for 40 days to get God to forgive the people and give them another chance. Then he went up another 40 days. He came down 120 days later after the first time, and that was Yom Kippur, the first time God had forgiven the Jewish people for their crime. And he gave them the second tablets. When he gave them the second tablets, he wasn't just giving them tablets. He was giving them the Torah with all of its particulars in a obviously hinted form. So that Yom Kippur is the appropriate time for us to underscore that we embrace the entirety of the Torah. Another thing, another point. When the Jewish people were first told about the Torah, they said, Na seven nishma, we will do it and then we will hear what it's all about. And the Midrash asked the question, and we discussed this in an earlier class, why does it say that God had to coerce them to take the Torah? He put a mountain over their head and threatened that if they don't accept the Torah, that'll be the end of their existence. And the Midrash answers, they embraced the written Torah, they didn't exactly accept the oral Torah. That was a little bit too much for them, and they were forced into it, they were coerced into it. Well, that it doesn't mean that they really accepted the Torah wholeheartedly. But in Yom Kippur, one could speculate when God gave the Jews another opportunity and he sent Moses down with a second set of tablets and all that is contained within those tablets, this time the Jewish people embraced it in its totality, the written and the oral Torah. So Yom Kippur is about accepting the totality, getting rid of compromises. Living in exile is the biggest compromise to our existence, the biggest compromise to the integrity of our Judaism because we are denied to observe so many of the commandments because we're living in the diaspora, because we don't have the Beit HaMikdash, and so on and so forth. So whenever we talk about annulling vows, it should remind us of the idea that the vow is a symbol of exile because a person makes a vow when they feel weak the spirituality is in need of a boost nulling the vow means we no longer need to be attached to this vow we are free spiritually free and we are able to enter into the new year in the case of yom kippur and we're able to do it in an uncompromised way in a manner that bespeaks geula redemption